Uh, hello everyone and welcome to this week's uh, third part of this week's lecture. In this lecture we are going to talk about different properties of fluids that are very important when we are designing uh, fluid flow systems, for example piping networks or pumping networks. So it is important to know what are different properties. Uh, so these are some of the properties that we will be looking at in the coming slides. But before uh, we look at the detail of these properties, it is important to understand the fundamental assumption we use when studying these properties in engineering, uh, not only for fluid mechanics, but for all the subjects of engineering. So that is what we call a continuum approximation. This might be the first time you have heard of it. And uh, so let's look at it, what is continuum approximation. So a continua is the medium in which a transport process occurs. Uh, and in its uh, simplicity, it means that uh, it is actually fluid in what we are studying or what is under consideration. So it can be liquid or gases. And then as engineers, uh, instead of looking at the molecules of these fluids, we tend to actually look at uh, control volumes that comprise of many of these uh, molecules of this fluid. So the size of this uh, control volume is really important. So for example, if you look at very small control volume, you will see that if we try to define a property of this control volume, let's say density, that is mass per unit volume, uh, we will get a very uh, uncertain value because the molecules can uh, go in and out of this control volume. And as such, we will have much more uncertainty. But if you define a much larger control volume with many more molecules, you will get a much more stable uh, value of this density because a few molecules jumping in and out of this bigger control volume will not make a big difference. So as such, the continuum assumption is what it means is that if we have uh, a bulk of fluid, so the, the properties of one point or one control volume in this fluid uh, would be representative of the whole bulk of this fluid. Okay, so each point will have same properties in this fluid under the continuum approximation. And mathematically speaking, it uh, simplifies our life a lot because instead of developing one equation for each point in this bulk, we can actually develop one equation for this one unit or one control volume and then apply it for the whole bulk. Okay. Um, in the coming lectures, you will be we will be talking about a lot uh, about control volumes when we drive different equations. So this is the basic assumption behind it. Without this assumption, we cannot uh, use uh, these control volumes to drive the equation for the whole bulk of fluid. Okay. So let's uh, look at some of the properties now. So some of them are fairly obvious. Uh, for example, density that is uh, pretty obvious is the mass per unit volume, uh, that is kilograms per cubic meter or pound per cubic feet. And based off this density, uh, we can characterize fluids in two groups, incompressible fluids, uh, uh, where the density is not a function of pressure. It means that you cannot actually compress these fluids. So for example, if you have a beaker and you have few molecules of liquid inside, by increasing pressure, you cannot compress this, and as such, the density will not change. On the other hand, if you have a, a block of these gas molecules, you can put the same number of molecules in a much smaller volume by increasing pressure. It means that you change its density as a function of pressure, and these fluids are called compressible fluids. Okay. And again, uh, it is uh, very important for us to understand if we can take the density as constant or not, because in all differential equations, uh, it will be important. So related to density, we have some other terms that might uh, you might see in some textbooks. So it is important to just mention of those properties as well. So we have specific weight that is uh, represented by gamma, and that is the weight per unit volume. Uh, so instead of mass, you have weight per unit volume, and with these equations, you can relate density with the specific weight. And another related term is what we call specific volume, that is the volume per unit mass. So uh, as you can clearly see that it is just the reciprocal of, uh, of density. Okay. 
uh, a very important uh, property uh, that is uh, kind of uh, we use a lot is what we call specific gravity. So specific gravity actually is the ratio of density of your fluid to the density of reference fluid. So this is one way of actually making the density uh, independent of your fluid. So for example, in terms of um, uh, density of your reference fluid, so if you are talking about liquids, uh, we will take the density of water, that is 1000 kilogram per cubic meter. And if you are dealing with gases, you will take air as reference fluid, that is 1.29 kilogram per meter cube. Please do not make mistake if you're dealing with gases, please do not use the density of water as a reference fluid. Okay, so please keep that in mind. Uh, so the specific gravity of, of uh, liquids uh, more particularly has important consequences. So for example, if your specific density is less than one, it means that a liquid under, under study will float on the surface of water, or it means that it is lighter than water. And for example, for the case of oil, so if you, for example, if you put uh, some water in a glass and then put oil, you will see that because the density of oil is less than water, it will float on the surface of water. So it means its specific gravity is less than one. And as such, uh, we can actually use this effect for many applications, for example, um, oil spill. So we can control oil spill if, if there is a leak in, in sea from an oil shipper. And you can see that we can use these tubes, these absorbent tubes, and we can actually contain this oil, um, uh, re oil leak region because the oil is actually floating on the surface of water. Similarly, when we are drilling oil, uh, we can use this effect or this consequence uh, and we can easily remove oil that is actually mixed with water, but because the density of oil is less than water, so it is actually floating on the surface of water. So we don't have to separate oil from water. We can literally just remove it from the top of the of the water. Okay. Uh, then a very important term uh, that we will be using uh, a lot, and and we will be talking about it a lot in the coming lectures, is what we call viscosity. Uh, it, you might have an intuitive sense of uh, viscosity. So, for example, if you fill these three tubes with three different liquids, let's say you have water, water, uh, you have glycerin, and you have uh, honey, for example, you will see that and try to drop an object through these uh, tubes, you will see that the, the object will fall at different rate. And that is because uh, the effect of viscosity. So what is viscosity? Viscosity is, uh, or dynamic viscosity, in, in, uh, as you will see in some books, is a property of fluid by which it resists uh, motion. And uh, we learned that um, for an ideal fluid, actually it does not resist shear stress and it continuously deforms. But in reality, when the fluid is uh, flowing in between different layers of, of liquid, you have some resistance. And this resistance between the fluid is what we call viscosity. The difference between ideal fluid is that it does not have any friction between layers. But in reality, we actually do have friction between, between these layers of fluid. And that's what we call viscosity. So um, what it means that, for example, if you dip a jar of honey, you will see that it will flow much slowly, while if you uh, dip a jar of water, it will flow very quickly. And that is uh, showing you that uh, the honey has much more higher viscosity and resistance to flow compared to water that has much less resistance to flow and as such less viscosity. Okay. And the reason we have this viscosity is because of the cohesion between the molecules. Molecules don't want to, um, for example, move for, from their position of rest. And to, to, to let them move, you have to uh, exert force. And that is what we call shear stress, for example. And um, so when you, um, 
for most fluids, uh, when you apply shear stress, it means that you apply a tangential force uh, on the surface of fluid. You will see that there um, is a proportional, linear uh, proportional shear rate. So what is this shear rate? So you can uh, think of it as an example here, for example. So let's say you have a fluid element that is a real fluid. It means that it has viscosity. And you put it between a stationary surface and a moving conveyor belt. And at the surface that is stationary, the fluid element will have a velocity that is zero. But as you move away from this uh, stationary fluid and go to uh, the fluid that is in contact with this belt, you will see that the, viscose, the velocity of the fluid layer is actually increasing. It means if you plot it, and that is actually plotting here, for example, that is the same situation here. So here you have the stationary plate and here you have a plate that is moving with the speed u. So if you plot the velocity of different layers, you will see that the velocity will increase as you go away from the stationary surface. And this gradient in velocity is what we call shear strain rate. It means the change in the in the velocity profile of the fluid. So Newton observed that, it means that what he observed that when you apply shear stress actually is proportional to shear rate. Um, so, and the constant of this relationship is what we call viscosity, okay? That is the resistance to the, uh, to the, to the motion of the fluid. Uh, the viscosity has units of newton second per cubic meter and um, uh, and also we call another unit we use another unit that is pascal seconds um, in some uh, places we use another unit that is centipoise that is actually equivalent or can be related with the pascal seconds so one centipoise uh, is equal to one uh, meter one milli pascal second which means tends to the power minus three pascal second okay and um, we will talk a lot about um, about uh, viscosity in the coming lectures because we are going to use a lot of equations and uh, and we will look at what are the implications of viscosity in derivation of those equations okay so viscosity of, uh, of fluids actually uh, change with the temperature. Um, so for the case of liquids, the viscosity of, of, the, of the liquid decreases with the increase in temperature, while for the case of gases, the viscosity of gases increases with temperature. Uh, why it is? Because for the case of liquids, for example, as you increase the temperature, you actually provide more energy to the molecules and you diminish their cohesive forces or, or the forces that were resisting the motion of the fluid and you kind of give it more energy and then the molecules can move much more when they were at low temperature. Because of this diminishing nature of this uh, cohesive forces, your liquid is much more uh, easy to flow. Okay, And that's why its viscosity decreases. While for the case of gases, uh, when you increase the temperature, you are again providing more energy to the molecules and they will have much higher degree of collision at higher temperature compared to low temperature. So it means that at high temperature, you have more collisions and because of that, the molecules will resist the flow in the direction of, in the direction of flow, for example. And as such, your viscosity will increase uh, with temperature. Just to give you uh, some numbers, for example, uh, to, to visualize what viscosity is and how it varies with different fluids. So for example, for the case of water, it has a viscosity of one centipoise. Okay. Um, then we have, let's say, a more common liquid is honey. So honey has a viscosity of 7,000 CP. It means that it is actually 7,000 times more viscous than water and it's it's kind of a bit surprising sometimes when you talk in terms of numbers it doesn't feel like it's so viscous 
but actually it's 7,000 times more viscous. And then if you look at uh, ketchup, and we are all familiar with ketchup not flowing out of bottles, so it has a viscosity of almost 100,000. And then really viscous fluids, that is, for example, toothpaste, that has a viscosity of 300,000, sorry, um, yeah, 300,000 CP. So it is 300,000 times more viscous than water, okay? So an interesting topic uh, to talk about on, on dinners and lunches with your friends. Then another property um, that is related with the viscosity is called kinematic viscosity. And uh, again, you might see it in some books uh, or in some formulation. So just to introduce it, what it is, actually it's the ratio of uh, dynamic viscosity or viscosity with the density of the fluid. So for example, you have viscosity of water divided by the density of water. And the resultant of that, you will get kinematic viscosity of water. So its units are meter square per second or uh, more commonly used units are stokes. So you can again relate this uh, unit with the metric unit by zero. So one stoke is 0 0.001 meter square per second. Okay. So in your exams and all the problems, please use the metric systems. It will be much more convenient for you. Okay. Uh, then another property uh, that is again uh, very uh, useful, especially for the case of liquids, is what we call uh, surface tension. And so surface tension, um, so we know that molecules, uh, all the fluids are made of molecules and uh, they have two types of forces, uh, sorry, cohesion forces and uh, adhesion forces. So cohesion forces are the forces between uh, the molecules of the liquid, for example, um, for example, here you can see that two molecules of the, in the bulk of the liquid, they will attract each other. And these are what we call cohesion forces, while if the liquid is in contact with another surface or air, for example, uh, in case of liquids, if it is maintaining a free surface. So that uh, interaction is what we call adhesion forces. It means that the ability of the molecule of this liquid to stick with the surface of this uh, material. Uh, now for the case of uh, for the case of liquids, for example, uh, in the bulk of the liquid, you will see that the cohesion forces are balanced. It means that this molecule, all, all the molecules are actually in, in a balanced state of, um, of uh, forces, for example. So, you don't have an imbalance of forces. So this molecule is attracted by other molecules on all its sides. But if you look at the surface, you will see that uh, there is an imbalance of forces because there are no molecules uh, on this side that are actually pulling uh, this molecule. So there is a kind of an imbalance. So this imbalance of force at the surface of the, of the, of the water or surface of liquid uh, create a surface tension. It means that the molecules at the surface are being pulled inside uh, towards the bulk of the fluid, and that surface tension or that tension is what we call surface tension. Okay, so this surface tension is caused by the unbalance of forces at the surface of the liquid, which actually tend to minimize its size of interface. It means that uh, if you have a have a, if you put a drop of liquid, it will arrange its shape in a way to minimize the contact between this interface and the, the fluid that is here, that is in, for example, in the case of droplet is air. So this surface tension is the reason why we have uh, circular droplets, for example. And based on surface tension, we can divide materials into wetting and non wetting uh, materials. So for example, if a droplet, uh, if you look at the tangent of this curve of this droplet surface, uh, the angle between the plane of the, of the droplet to the tangent on the surface is what we call contact angle. So if this angle is lower than 90, 
we call them wetting behavior or wetting uh, liquids. It means that they like to spread on the surface of the substrate. While if the contact angle is larger than 90, it means that they do not like to spread on the surface of that fluid, of, of that substrate. So for example, here you can see on this cloth, it's very wetting. Uh, the liquid, the water is actually spreading itself while for this cloth, the liquid is much more uh, circular and trying to minimize its surface. And that is what a circular shape is, okay? And surface tension is the reason why we have, uh, for example, here, the shape of these droplets or the shape of this uh, liquid sheet uh, uh, here, okay? So that is because they want to minimize the contact area between uh, the, the other fluid that is, in this case, is air. Now, the last property that we will look at uh, is what we call vapor pressure, and vapor pressure is very important, and you will see um, in the coming lectures where we, for example, especially when we are talking about pumping and a lot in, you will talk about in thermodynamics about vapor pressure and how it affects different systems. So what is vapor pressure? We know that uh, different liquids, for example, they have the tendency to, to evaporate. Okay, so the molecules go from liquid to the surface that is above it. And, but if you cap this bottle, for example, the case here, the molecules will evaporate and after some time they will develop some pressure because the molecules are being evaporated and trying to push them out self. Uh, and that is what we call partial pressure. But if you give it time, uh, there will be uh, a, um, uh, a kind of a situation where the rate of molecules going from liquid to vapor or to the gas phase will become equal to the molecules of this or vapors of this liquid going back to the liquid state. Okay. And that is when we say that the system is in equilibrium and the pressure that is here is what we call vapor pressure. So, vapor pressure is the partial pressure of gas. At equilibrium and you can actually um, very easily experience this if you for example buy a bottle of cola you will see that uh, it doesn't look there is any gas on the top of cola but when you open the lid there is a <laughs> sound <laughs> and it shows that there was actually gas molecules and um, they were there and once you release it you will see that the bubble starts to uh, come out of the liquid because you when you when you release the pressure from the top of that liquid you actually reduce the pressure and then the bubbles are actually escaping uh, from the gas uh, from the liquid okay uh, so the vapor pressure uh, is uh, very much affected by temperature so if you increase the temperature the vapor pressure increases as well so for example if you are let's say you have this big this bottle uh, that is capped here. And if you heat this uh, liquid inside this bottle, you will generate a lot of molecules that are actually going from the liquid to the gas phase, In, for example, uh, just like boiling, for example. So a lot of molecules will escape from liquid to gas phase and they will actually exert much more pressure here. So when you increase temperature, you are actually creating much more pressure uh, on the top of on the surface at the top of this liquid, okay? And that is why the vapor pressure will also increase with the temperature. And uh, you will see the um, uh, vapor pressure is very important for when we are looking at pumps and uh, different uh, systems like impellers and all these things, because if you, for example, have a system and you have a impeller or, or a pump where you have sudden drop in pressure, so the, the gas molecules that are in the water actually will form these tiny bubbles uh, around the surface of this blade, for example. And when this high speed blade will hit this bubble, it will actually cause damage to this blade. So in pump designing, we are very uh, careful that uh, we never have a pressure situation that is below the vapor pressure of the liquid because uh, if it happens, the, the the liquid will vaporize and then can damage uh, the the pump impeller, for example. So you will look uh, this with the Dr. Tom's in in week eight, I think. Uh, so with that, uh, we are uh, finished with uh, the properties of fluids.
in the next part we will talk about uh, different units and uh, dimension systems and uh, with that uh, thank you so much for your time